Chapter 9, Part 2 of Aircraft and Submarines by Willis J. Abbott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by William Tomko. The United States at War, Part 2. It was that feeling, coupled with the widespread belief that aircraft furnished the best means of combating the submarine, that caused an irresistible demand in the United States for the construction of colossal fleets of these flying crafts. Congress enacted in midsummer the law appropriating $640 million for the construction of aircraft and the maintenance of the aerial service. The Secretaries of War and the Navy each appealed for heavy additional appropriations for aerial service. The arguments which have already been set forth as supporting the use of aircraft in military service were paralleled by those who urge its unlimited use in naval service. Consider, said they, the primary need for attacking these vipers of the sea in their nests. Once out on the broad Atlantic, their chances of roaming about undetected by destroyers or other patrol boats are almost unlimited. But we know where they come from, from Kiel, Antwerp, Wilhelmshaven, Ostend and Zeebrugge. Catch them there and you will destroy them as boys destroy hornets by smoking out their nests. But against this the Germans have provided by blocking every avenue of approach save one. The channels are obstructed and mined and guarded from the shore by heavy batteries. No hostile ships dare run that gauntlet. Even the much boasted British Navy in the three years of the war has not ventured to attack a single naval base. You could not even seek out the submarines thus sheltered by other submarines, because running below the surface our boats could not detect either mines or nets and would be doomed to destruction. The enemy boats come out on the surface, protected by the batteries and naval craft, but the air cannot be blocked by any fixed defenses. Give us more and more powerful aircraft than the German possess, and we will darken the sky above the German bases with the wings of our airplanes and rain explosive shells upon the submarines that have taken shelter there until none survive. The one essential is that our flyers shall be in overwhelming numbers. We must be able not only to take care of any flying force that the Germans may send against us, but also to have enough of our aircraft not engaged in the aerial battle to devote their entire attention to the destruction of the enemy forces below. From every country allied with us came approval of this policy. At the time the debate was pending in Congress, our allies, one after another, were sending to us official commissions to consult upon the conduct of the war, to give us the benefit of their long and bitter experience in it, and to assist in any way our preparations for taking a decisive part in that combat. The subject of the part to be played by aircraft was one frequently discussed with them, with the French Commission came two members of the staff of General Joffre, Major Tolasny, and Lieutenant de la Grange, experts in aviation service. A formal interview given out by these gentlemen expressed so clearly the point of view on aviation and its possibilities held in France, where it has reached its highest development, that some extracts from it will be of interest here. At the beginning of the war, the Germans were the only ones who had realized the great importance of aviation from a military point of view, said these officers. France had looked upon aviation as a sport, Germany as a powerful weapon in war. This is illustrated by the fact that even in August 1914, German artillery fire was directed by airplanes. It was only after the retreat from Belgium and the Battle of the Marne that the Allies realized the great importance of aviation. Between August 15th and 25th, the French general staff thought that the greater part of the German army was concentrated in Alsace and that only a few army corps were coming through Belgium. It was only through the reports of the aviators that they realized that this was a mistake and that almost the whole of the German army was invading Belgium. Immediately after the Battle of the Marne, the greatest efforts were made in France to develop the aviation corps in every possible way. The English army, then in process of formation, profited by the experience of the French. Since that time, the Allied as well as the German Aviation Corps has grown constantly. A modern army is incomplete if it has not a strong aviation corps. All the different services are obliged to turn to the Aviation Corps for help in their work. An army without airplanes is like a soldier without eyes. 
an army which has the superiority in aviation over its adversary will have the following advantages it will have constantly the latest information on the movements of the enemy in this way no concentration of troops will be ignored and no surprise attack will be possible the attack against the enemy positions will be rendered easier because all the details of these positions will be thoroughly known beforehand the artillery fire will be much more accurate many enemy machines will be brought down by the superior fighting machines and the result will be to strengthen the morale both of the aviators and of the army the next question put to the french experts was why do we need to make a great effort to obtain the superiority in the air they answered with much interesting detail because the germans have understood the importance of aviation from a military point of view and have concentrated all their forces to develop this service owing to the large number of scientists and technicians they possess they are able constantly to perfect motors and planes owing to their great industrial organization they are able to produce an enormous number of the best machines the german aviation service is now fully as strong as that of the allies as far as numbers are concerned the superiority in the air can only remain in the hands of the allies because of the spirit of self-sacrifice of their aviators and their greater skill germany feels that the decisive phase of the war is imminent and the efforts she will make next year will be infinitely greater than any she has made before she will try in every way to regain the supremacy of the air realizing what a formidable enemy america can be in the air she will strengthen her aviation forces in consequence the aeroplane is by far the most powerful of all the modern weapons if the allies have the supremacy of the air the german artillery will lose its accuracy of aim it is impossible because of the long range for modern guns to fire without the help of airplanes the accuracy of artillery fire depends entirely on its being directed by an airplane this was clearly illustrated during the battle of the somme in nineteen sixteen the french at that time had concentrated such a large number of fighting machines that no german machine was allowed to fly over the lines on the other hand the allies reconnaissance machines were so numerous that each french battery could have its fire directed by an airplane the destruction of the enemy positions was in consequence carried out very effectively and very rapidly while the germans were obliged to fire blindly and scatter their shells over large areas incapable as they were of locating our battery emplacements and the positions of our troops unluckily a few weeks later the germans had called from the different parts of the line a good many of their squadrons and were able to carry out their work under better conditions we need such a superiority that it will be impossible for any german airplane to fly anywhere near the lines every german kite balloon every airplane would immediately be attacked by a number of allied machines in this way the german aviation will not only be dominated but will be entirely crushed if we can prevent the germans from seeing through their airplanes what we are preparing we will be very near the end of the war it will require a huge effort to carry out this plan neither the english nor the french are able to do so by their own means as far as france is concerned she is able to keep on building machines rapidly enough to increase her aviation corps at about the same rate as germany is increasing hers if she wanted to double or triple her production of machines she could do so but she would have to call back from the trenches a certain number of skilled workmen and this would weaken her fighting power she needs in the trenches all the men who are able to carry a rifle if the allies are to have the absolute supremacy of the air which we have been describing it will be the privilege of america to give it to them we want three or four or even five allied machines for one german america only has the possibilities of production which would allow her to build an enormous number of machines in a very short time the airplane is a great engine of destruction it tells the artillery where to fire it drops bombs it gives the enemy all the information he needs to plan murderous attacks drive the german airplanes down and you will save the lives of thousands of men in our trenches as ulysses in the cavern put out the eye of the cyclops so the eyes of the beast must be put out before you can attempt to kill it major tulana and lieutenant de la grange then outlined what the aviation program of the united states should be 
saying, American industry must be enabled to begin building at once. No time must be lost in experiments. America must profit by the experience of the Allies. She must choose the best planes and build thousands of them. She must build reconnaissance machines, which she will need for her army. She must build a large number of fighting machines, because it is these machines that will destroy German planes. She must also build squadrons of powerful bombing machines, which will go behind the German lines to destroy the railway junctions and bomb the enemy cantonments, so as to give the soldiers no rest even when they have left the trenches. Bombing done by a few machines gives poor results. The same cannot be said of this operation carried out by a large number of machines, which can go to the same places and bomb continually. Besides the number of men that are actually killed in these raids, great disturbance is caused in the enemy's communication lines, thereby hindering the operations. For example, since the British Admiralty has increased the number of its bombing squadrons in northern France, and has decided to attack constantly the two harbors of Ostend and Zeebrugge, and the locks, bridges, and canals leading to them, they have greatly interfered with the activity of these two German bases. It is certain that shortly, owing to this, these two ports will no more be used by German torpedo boats and submarines. What the English Royal Naval Air Service has been able to accomplish with 100 machines, the Flying Corps of the United States with 1,000 machines, must be able to carry out on other parts of the front. The work of the bombing machines is rendered difficult now by the fact that the actual lines are far from Germany but it is hoped that soon fighting will be carried on near the enemy frontier and then a wonderful field will be opened to the bombing machines all the big ammunition factories which are in the rhine and ruhr valleys like krupp's will be wonderful targets for the american bombing machines if these machines are of the proper type that is to say, sufficiently fast and well armed and able to carry a great weight of bombs, nothing will prevent them from destroying any of these important factories. As Germany at the present time is only able to continue the war because of her great stock of war material, the destruction of her sources of production would be the end of her resistance. For this, also the Allies must turn to America. Such a large number of machines is required to produce results that America must be relied on to manufacture them. Every man in this country must know that it is in the power of the United States, no matter what can be done in other fields, to bring the war to an end simply by concentrating all its energies on producing an enormous amount of material for aviation, and to enlist a corresponding number of pilots but this will not be done without great effort in order to be ready for the great nineteen eighteen offensive work must be begun at once the extreme secrecy which in this war has characterized the operation of the governments our own most of all makes it impossible to state the amount of progress made in nineteen seventeen in the construction of our aerial fleet during the debate in Congress, orators were very outspoken in their prophecies that we should outnumber the Kaiser's flying fleet two or three to one. The press of the nation was so very explicit in its descriptions of the way in which we were to blind the Germans and drive them from the air that it is no wonder the Kaiser's government took alarm and set about building additional aircraft with feverish zeal. In this it was imitated by France and England. It seemed all at once about the middle of 1917 that the whole belligerent world suddenly recognized the air as a final battlefield and began preparations for its conquest. All statistical estimates in wartime are subject to doubt as to their accuracy, and particularly those having to do in any way with the activities of an enemy country but competent estimators or at any rate shrewd guessers think that germany's facilities for constructing airplanes equal those of france and england together if then all three nations build to the very limit of their abilities there will be a tie which the contribution of aircraft from the united states will settle overwhelmingly in favor of the allies how great that contribution may be cannot be foretold with certainty at this moment the building of aircraft was a decidedly infant industry in this country when war began in the eight years prior to nineteen sixteen the government had given orders for just fifty nine aircraft scarcely enough to justify manufacturers in keeping their shops open orders from foreign governments 
took her place as national honor and national safety demanded among the Entente Allies. Mr. Howard E. Coffin, chairman of the aircraft section of the Council of National Defense, was able to report eight companies capable of turning out about 14,000 machines in six months. A better showing than British manufacturers could have made when Great Britain first entered the war. A feature in the situation which impressed both Congress and the American people was the exposure by various military experts of the defenseless condition of New York City against an air raid by a hostile foreign power. At the moment, of course, there was no danger. The only hostile foreign power with any considerable naval or aerial force was Germany, and her fleet was securely bottled up in her own harbors by the overpowering fleet of Great Britain. Yet, if one could imagine the British fleet reduced to inefficiency, let us say by a futile, suicidal attack upon Kiel or Heligoland, which would leave it crippled and free the Germans, or if we could conceive that the German threat to reduce Great Britain to subjection by the submarine campaign proved effective, the peril of New York would then be very real and very immediate. For, although the harbor defenses are declared by military authorities to be practically impregnable against attack by sea, they would not be effective against an attack from the air. A hostile fleet carrying a number of seaplanes could go round to out of range of our shore batteries and loose their flyers who could within less than an hour be dropping bombs on the most congested section of Manhattan Island. It is true that our own navy would have to be evaded in such case but the attack might be made from points more distant from New York and at which no scouts would ever dream of looking for an enemy. The development in later months of the big, heavily armed cruising machines makes the menace to any seaport city like New York still greater. The Germans have built great biplanes with two fuselages, or bodies, armored, carrying two machine guns and one automatic rifle to each body. They have twin engines of 340 horsepower and carry a crew of six men. They are able, in an emergency, to keep the air for not less than three days. It is obvious that a small fleet of such machines launched from the deck of a hostile squadron, let us say in the neighborhood of Block Island, could menace equally Boston or New York, or by flying up the sound, could work ruin and desolation upon all the defenseless cities bordering that body of water nor are the germans alone in possessing machines of this type the giant sikorsky machines of russia mentioned in an earlier chapter have during the war been developed into types capable of carrying crews of twenty-five men with guns and ammunition the french after having brought down one of the big german machines with the double bodies instantly began building aircraft of their own of an even superior type some of these are driven by four motors and carry eleven persons besides guns and ammunition the caproni machines of italy are even bigger capable of carrying nine guns and thirty-five men the congressional committee was much impressed by consideration of what might be done by a small fleet of aircraft of this type launched from a hostile squadron off the capes of chesapeake bay and operating against washington it is not likely that any foreign foe advancing by land could repeat the exploit of the British who burned the capital in 1812. But in our present defenseless state, a dozen aircraft of the largest type might reduce the national capital to ruins. If an enemy well provided with aerial force possesses such power of offense, an equal power of defense is given to the nation at all well provided with flying craft in imitation, or perhaps rather in modification, of the English plan for guarding the coasts of Great Britain, a well-matured system of defending the American coasts has been worked out and submitted to the national authorities. It involves the division of the coasts of the United States into 13 aeronautical districts, each with aeronautical stations established at suitable points and all in communication with each other. Eight of these districts would be laid out on the Atlantic coast, extending from the northern boundary of Maine to the Rio Grande River. Just what the purpose and value of these districts would be may be explained by taking the case not of a typical one, but of the most important one of all, the third district including the coastline from New London, Connecticut to Barnegat Inlet, New Jersey. This, of course, includes New York and adjacent commercial centers and the entrance to Long Island Sound, 
with its long line of thriving cities and the ports of the places from which come our chief supplies of munitions of war it includes the part of the united states which an enemy would most covet the part which at once would furnish the richest plunder and possession of which by a foe would most cripple this nation Today it is defended by stationary guns and land fortresses and in time of attack will be further guarded by a fringe of cruising naval vessels apparently up to the middle of nineteen seventeen the government thought no aerial watch was needed but if we were to follow the methods which all the belligerent nations of europe are employing on their sea coasts we would establish in this district ten aeronautical stations this would be no match for the british system which has one such station to every twenty miles of coast ours would be farther apart but as a sound could be guarded at its entrance the stations need only be maintained along the south shore of long island and down the jersey coast each station would be provided with patrol fighting and observation airplanes it would have the mechanical equipment of microphones searchlights and other devices for detecting the approach of an enemy now employed successfully abroad its patrolling airplanes would cruise constantly far out to sea not less than eighty miles keeping ever in touch with their station as the horizon visible from a soaring airplane is not less than fifty miles distant from the observer this would mean that no enemy fleet could approach within one hundred thirty miles of our coast without detection and report the montauk point station would be charged with guarding the entrance to long island sound and the waters of nantucket shoals and block island sound where the german submarine u-53 did its deadly work in nineteen sixteen the Sandy Hook Station would of course be the most important of all, guarding New York seagoing commerce and protecting the ship channel by a constant patrol of aircraft over it. The modern airplane has a speed of from 80 to 160 miles an hour, the latter rate being attained only by the light scouts. Thus it is apparent that if an alarm were raised at any one of these stations between New London and Barnegat, three hours at most would suffice to bring the fighting equipment of all the stations to the point threatened. There would be thus concentrated a fleet of several hundred swift scouts, heavy fighting machines, the torpedo planes of the type designed by Admiral Fisk, hydro aeroplanes capable of carrying heavy guns, and in brief, every form of aerial fighter. Moreover, by use of the wireless, every ship of the Navy, within a radius of several hundred miles, would be notified of the menace. They could not reach the scene of action so swiftly as the flying men, but the former would be able to hold the foe in action until the heavier ships should arrive. The enormous advantage of such a system of guarding our coasts needs no further explanation it is not even experimental for France, on her limited coast, has one hundred fifty such stations. England, which started the war with 18, had 114 in 1917, and was still building. We, at that time, had none. Although the extent of our sea coast and the great multiplicity of practicable harbors make us more vulnerable than any other nation. End of The United States at War, Part 2 Recording by William Tomko